webinar series. So Dr. Noor Faroud is joining us today. Uh, she is a research scientist at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Lethbridge, Alberta. And I've known Dr. Faroud now for, I'm not going to say how many years. We did grad school at the same time. And so it's a true honor to, to invite her here and, and have her speak today. Uh, Nora began her adventures in plant science and agriculture research uh, as a summer student in 1999, so she's more willing to have dates uh, than I would be. <laughs> and first she was working for a potato breeder and then continued to work in agriculture as a student and a technician at AAFC in Lethbridge and at the Center for Plant Health in Sydney, BC. And I will say that the um, AAFC in Lethbridge is truly an amazing place. It's uh, well connected across the province and uh, and the university. And so it's it's a fantastic um, a place for training and, and uh, learning and growth and advances. Uh, Nora then completed a master's in lipobiochemistry, working with oilseed crops with Professor Randall Westlake, and finally began her work in Fusarium head blight disease in wheat in 2005. And she completed her PhD through the University of British Columbia with Dr. Brian Ellis and Francois Oudes. And in her current post, she's interested in hormone and kinase signaling pathways and continues to study these within fusarium head blight, and then also branching out to stomatal development and abiotic stresses. And she has collaborations. She's built these collaborations across Canada, as well as colleagues in Australia, England, and Italy. And we were just talking about, uh, Nora was at the European uh, Fungal Genetics Conference in Austria last week. And so she has... Um, uh, great, great opportunities for networking in that there, and we'll speak today about her work on Fusarium head blight. Uh, and so with that, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, it's Thank you for the opportunity to be here. It's very nice to uh, to give a seminar. It's since COVID, I feel like it's been a long time since I've had the opportunity to do these uh, types of presentations. And it's nice now uh, we have better online platforms for these uh, things as well. So I'm um, just going to move this out of the way. Okay. So, um, so as Jennifer mentioned, my interests, in, research interests are in uh, cell signaling, particularly in uh, hormone signaling and protein kinases. And my main research area is in the fusarium wheat interaction. So fusarium head blight is a disease of uh, cereal crops. And this is a, a wheat head or spike. It's the inflorescence or the flowering structure. And uh, fusarium spores can land on the surface and infect the florets or the spikelets. And once they've established infection there, the fungus can enter the main stem or the rachis and spread down the head. Typically you get uh, vessel uh, obstruction and so you don't get uh, the fungus moving upwards, but you do get this bleaching or blight, hence the name Fusarium head blight. Um, so it's it's a cereal of it's a disease of wheat, barley, and oats, and there is also a related disease called Fusarium ear blight in maize, um, caused by a similar an overlap of the same uh, Fusarium species that causes this disease, but because. Uh, Maize is a little bit different of a crop than the other cereals. Um, it's a, the disease uh, presents a, a little bit differently. So once the uh, fungus establishes infection in the wheat spikes, uh, it can contaminate, damage the, the kernels that develop and contaminate them with uh, fusarium mycotoxins. The main mycotoxin that we identify in cereals are the uh, trichothecene mycotoxin called DON. And I'll talk a little bit more about this later on in my presentation. So I'm going to give start with a, a basic background on fusarium fungi. And then I'm going to talk a little bit more about fusarium head blight disease, giving a brief history. And then I'll move on to some of my research interests and I'll uh, present some results in some of the work that we're doing on my mitogen activated protein kinases or MAP kinases in Fusarium graminarum. So Fusarium, uh, of course, belongs to the kingdom fungi. It is a dicaria, a dicaria which means um, it can have two unfused nuclei. It can exist in this dicaryotic phase for uh, several cell cycles before uh, karyogamy occurs and you get the, the diploid cell. And um, it is, uh, sorry, it's a, so 
um, within the dicarious uh, sub kingdom, there are two phyla, the Basidiomycota or Basidiomycetes, and this includes many of the fungi that most people, uh, when they think of mushrooms, this is uh, this includes these uh, mushroom species. And uh, it also includes the uh, rust species, which I find very fascinating. Um, the apple cedar rust, for example. Um, apple cedar rust is uh, uh, caused by, uh, I don't remember what the, the uh, genus species is, but it's a, it's a fungus that belongs to the Basidomycota uh, phylum and it forms galls on uh, junipers and then produces these uh, uh, orange uh, protrusions from the galls that are called telial horns and then they release uh, teliospores. And so uh, the rust species have multiple spore types and this is just one of the four spore types that it produces. And then it, uh, it needs two hosts to complete the life cycle. And the second host are apples and crab apples. And this is how the disease presents in the apples and on the leaves. So, okay. uh, the basidiomycetes also include uh, the smuts. And this is an example of corn smut. Uh, it's a disease of corn and uh, obviously causes yield loss, but the fungus is also a delicacy in Mexico and South America. Um, they sell it in a can, make tacos with it. I've never tried it, but I am curious. To See, we have, it seems like we have a frozen presenter. We'll give her a second here and hopefully it comes back. So I think this is where I left off. Um, so Fusarium uh, is, uh, belongs to the Ascomycetes. And this is an example of, this is an example of the idea, uh, which is the asexual score type. And here you can see that, um, the dicaryot, dicaryotic stage, you can see the two separate nuclei um, during the uh, uh, parenthesial production, which is the um, sexual uh, spore type. So, um, so Fusarium uh, belongs to the Sora, Sordariomycetes, which produces the parenthesial type fruiting bodies and parenthesial ascospores. The teleomorph of Fusarium graminearum is Gibberella Z. And um, Fusarium was originally uh, characterized and named by Link in 1809. And there are over 100 species that have been identified. Um, some of these uh, are human pathogens that typically only infect uh, immunocompromised individuals. So I, as Jennifer mentioned, I just came back from the European uh, fungal genetics meeting and they had some people were talking about uh, fusarium diseases in humans and they had a picture of somebody's eye that was infected with fusarium and I'm very glad that I work in plants because every time I think about those images I get very uncomfortable but uh, fusarium species so um, there are many um, diseases caused by fusarium in plant um, so it's said that most plant species are susceptible to at least one disease caused by fusarium, uh, caused by fusarium. So um, this is one example, a Panama disease. It's caused by fusarium oxysporum, uh, Forme specialis cubensi. So Forme specialis uh, determines the host specificity. So some of the fusarium species, um, uh, uh, including Fusarium oxysporum, have different Forme specialis in terms of uh, causing diseases. And uh, the Panama disease is a, is a big problem because um, bananas are all genetically identical, and so they are all susceptible to this disease. And a little closer to home, we have uh, a picture here of Fusarium root rot, well, Fusarium and Aphanomyces root rot of peas. So pulse crops, lentils, peas, um, and uh, and beans uh, are susceptible to root rot by fusarium species. 
And um, in this study, my colleague in Lethbridge identified 10 species in, in Canadian pea fields. Um, and it also causes uh, diseases uh, in date palms. This is by Ude disease. And it's caused by Fusarium oxysporum formae specialis canar canariensis. And of course, Fusarium head blight is one of the diseases caused by Fusarium species. So the, those involved in uh, Fusarium head blight are mainly members of the Fusarium graminearum species complex, as well as Fusarium comora. There are other species that are also involved in Fusarium head blight. Uh, Fusarium avanaceum is one of them, and this is uh, also, Fusarium avanaceum is one of the um, FHB causing species that actually has quite a broad um, host range. It doesn't have any formase specialis, but it also infects peas and many other crops. Um, and uh, the Fusarium species involved in FHB are toxin producing. Primarily, the main, the main toxin that we identify uh, in Fusarium infected heads are the trichothecene toxins, though there are other classes that these, these fungi produce. And uh, Fusarium avanaceum is an exception in that it does not produce trichothecenes, but it does produce other classes of toxins. So trichothecenes are sesquiterpenoid mycotoxins. They're, um, they're secondary metabolites produced by the fungus. And this is the basic structure of a trichothecene. They're inhibitors of eukaryotic protein synthesis. Uh, they interact with the 60S ribosome at the peptidyl transferase center and so uh, prevent uh, uh, protein synthesis. So its uh, structure is uh, uh, three fused rings in addition to an epoxide ring. And this epoxide ring is essential for toxicity. There are four classes of trichothecenes and they are defined based on specific modifications in these five uh, variable R groups. Um, so in Fusarium head blight, we only have the type A and type B trichothecenes. So the type B trichothecenes are differentiated from others in that they have uh, a keto group at R5, whereas the type A um, the type A basically comprises everything that isn't a type B, C, or D. The type C group have an additional epoxide ring. Um, uh, trying to remember where that is. I think it's the nine and 10. Um, and then there, the type D have a macro cycle that, um, so they have an additional ring that's connected through uh, carbon four, at, so R2, to carbon six. I think that's wrong. I think it's carbon 15. I think it's through R R3. Um, so, um, so trichothecene mycotoxins are produced by other fungi as well, not just Fusarium, uh, produced by a group of fungi from the order Hypocrealis. And this includes the black mold fungus. Uh, that produces, that grows, so you, you might be familiar with sick building syndrome, um, and if you have black mold growing in your home, then you're likely to experience uh, neurological uh, complications as a re result to exposure to uh, these macrocyclic uh, trichothecenes. So this is an example of the type D trichothecenes. So as I mentioned, Fusarium, uh, head blight species produce either type A or type B trichothecenes. Uh, the main, main trichothecenes we get are the um, uh, type B producers or dioxin of alanol, uh, which is, so they, they produce a series of, of trichothecenes, but this is the main one we identify in, in wheat heads, uh, the dioxin of alanol or DON. And uh, the type A producers produce T2 toxins as well as other trichothecenes. And uh, the, type A trichothe the type A producers tend to proliferate in cooler regions. So they, are, they do cause fusarium head blight, but they're more common. You're more likely to find them in uh, overwintered in like on grain that's been overwintered in the field or in storage conditions. So the uh, trichothecenes are required for disease spread. 
in, in wheat heads. If you knock out this uh, TRI5 synthase gene, which is, um, which is the, the enzyme that encodes the first committed step to trichothecene biosynthesis, then what you get is um, no disease spread. So this is an example of a GFP uh, labeled uh, Fusarium strains. In the wild type, you see the fungus is infected. This spikelet that was inoculated, it entered the main stem or the rachis, spreads down, and then also infects uh, subsequent uh, spikelets. Whereas when you knock out the TRI5 gene, the disease is contained within this inoculated spikelet. So as I mentioned, Fusarium was first, uh, the name was assigned in 1809 by Link. In 18, uh, 1884, we have the first description of Fusarium head blight. Um, so this was published by Worthington G. Smith in a book entitled Diseases at, of Field and Garden Crops. And I'll note that he ident many of the diseases that he described in here uh, in other crops were also caused by Fusarium species. Um, it took a while for, even though Link named it in, in 1809, it took a while for the Fusarium community to come to a consensus and where everybody was calling the fungus Fusarium. So here it's described as Fusisporium. And um, so he, <laughs> this was always interesting how, you know, in, in the past it was thought that uh, fungi were part of the plant kingdom. So this plant may be named Fusisporium colmorum uh, WSM for William Smith. Um, but he did note that uh, a publication the year previous that uh, Fusarium graminearum or some closely allied species was identified. And in this case, um, uh, this author was looking at uh, had uh, uh, looking at malting barley and found mold growing on the on the grain. And as I think Jennifer knows from her work in her past work in Fusarium. Uh, that uh, uh, if you have uh, the Dawn mycotoxin in your uh, barley, when you're making beer, you get uh, gushing. So that uh, I think bottles can uh, burst open because the, of the force of the gushing of the beer uh, because of the, the Dawn mycotoxins, as well as some other, uh, I think, uh, hydrophobins, which are uh, found in, in a protein found in the fusarium fungus that can also cause gushing. So um, I always like <laughs> this uh, sentence here. So in both wheat and barley, the fungi, when present, give the grain a peculiar and disagreeable taste. So as you probably know, in the 19th century, chemists, one of the, one of the uh, properties that they would list when describing an element or, or a chemical would be the taste. And that's how we know, for example, that mercury is sweet, <laughs> but apparently fusarium is not. <laughs> so uh, moving forward, um, in uh, 1900, uh, fusarium head blight was first described in the United States, where it was called wheat scab, and it's still often referred to as scab in the US. Um, interestingly, um, in the literature, including stuff that I've written, uh, it says that in, it was first described as wheat scab in 1884. But when I look at now that I've looked at this book, and I, I don't have access to the whole book yet, just, you know, when you download online, you don't always get every, every page, but I have not found a single reference to the word scab. So I'm not sure if that's um, just knowledge that's been transferred through the <laughs> generations. Uh, but in any case, it was called wheat scab in, in 1900 in the U.S. And then the first report of Fusarium head blight in Canada came uh, in uh, 1919. And then in 1923, Fusarium graminearum was identified on corn stubble in Manitoba. There were sporadic outbreaks in eastern Canada and Manitoba uh, from, from that time moving forward. And in 1980, was, we had the first widespread Fusarium head blight epidemic in Canada. And from then on, there were many epidem epidemics throughout uh, North America. Um, 
I, I remember reading somewhere, though I haven't been able to find the reference, so I'm not sure if this is hearsay, but many farmers in Eastern Canada left the farms because of the devastation of, of the impact of Fusarium head blight on their crops. Um, and so, so I said, you know, Eastern Canada and Manitoba are the main regions where FHB was identified as being problematic. Um, this is because uh, Fusarium head blight uh, proliferates in wet environments. Um, when I first started working with Fusarium head blight, they said that we don't have any Fusarium in Alberta and we are not allowed to do uh, field work with Fusarium, which never impacted me because I don't do field work. But it's interesting because here in 1994, you can see that there was at least one, one strain identified in 1994. And over the years, you see it is present in Alberta and Saskatchewan, perhaps not as problematic as in Manitoba. And it tends to be more uh, present in the black soil zones, likely due to uh, higher moisture. Um, and, and it is also a problem in Alberta um, under irrigation. Historically, that's always been true as well. Um, so in 2014, Saskatchewan had significant yield losses due to FHB. And in, in what years um, in Alberta and Saskatchewan, in, in the more recent history, there have been uh, higher prevalence of, of FHB. And so I, Alberta and Saskatchewan farmers are, or uh, communities are taking the disease more seriously now as well. So as I'm sure you're familiar with this uh, disease triangle, in order to get disease, you need pathogen and a suitable ho host and a suitable environment to get disease. Um, and so now I'm going to show you a series of graphs that was put together by my colleague, uh, Dr. Robert Graff, a retired breeder from Lethbridge. So this is the insured spring wheat. The CWRS is the main Canadian Western red spring, is the main wheat variety that's cultivated in Western Canada. And so you can see over the years, um, so having resistance is the key to um, to preventing the impacts of this disease. Any kind of disease management strategy you have, if you don't have high levels of resistance under epidemic conditions, you're still gonna get disease um, and it's still gonna have a big impact. So, um, but it's been difficult for breeders to produce cultivars that have uh, high levels of resistance because it comes with poor agronomic and quality traits that farmers and the industry is use, used to in, uh, for Canadian uh, wheat and grain. So you can see over the years, as moderate resistant varieties became available in Manitoba, they overtook the, um, the number of uh, acres uh, compared to the susceptible crops and, and even the intermediately resistant crops. In Saskatchewan, you see an increase, though not as dramatic. In Alberta, under irrigation, you also see an increase, but under dry land, you can see we hardly have any uh, moderately resistant varieties. So, so this is the best we had for many years was moderate resistance. In uh, 2010, Rob Graff uh, registered Emerson, which is uh, has very high levels of resistance. It's a winter wheat variety that has now taken over most of the winter wheat acreage in Canada, in Western Canada. And uh, Tenacious was later registered as a spring wheat variety, also an Egg Canada variety that's very high, has very high levels of resistance. And um, it's a general purpose class, so it's not as uh, popular to grow as uh, uh, CWRS. So it doesn't have the same representation of acreage just because it's not a commonly grown class of wheat. So in 2016, we had the highest dawn across the country uh, identified in our grain. And this year, I remember I was flying to Ontario for the uh, Fusarium, Canadian Fusarium Head Blight meeting. And it was November and I was looking out the window of the plane and I saw harvesters out, uh, which I thought was very uh, unusual to be harvesting in November. 
Um, and this was a year where we had good yield across the country, uh, but we had a lot of rain during the harvest season, which delayed harvest. And the thing with uh, Fusarium head blight and dawn, if you inoculate the wheat heads during the early stages of kernel development, you get shriveled grain that have very clear uh, damage, fusarium damage. Whereas as you move on through the course of development, if you inoculate the wheat heads, um, you have fewer symptoms, but you do tend to get high dawn content if you inoculate at this stage. And so that's what happened in 2016. So what is the problem with having these mycotoxins contaminate the grain? Well, fortunately, I don't know if this is, uh, yeah, yeah, fortunately for, for us, dawn is, the, is, is more common than the type A trichothecenes that, uh, in contaminating uh, grain. Dawn uh, causes, it's also known as vomitoxin, it causes uh, intestinal irritation, uh, feed refusal in animals, um, and it does have, uh, have health implications. And I don't mean to say that it's not significant, but it's not likely to be fatal unless it's in very high doses. Whereas the type A trichothecenes, T2 toxin and HT2 toxin, causes a syndrome called alimentary toxic leukemia. And the symptoms of this are similar to radiation poisoning. And just to give you an idea of how serious it can be, in 1913 in Siberia, over 100,000 people died from uh, ATA by eating contaminated grain. And similarly, there were many deaths in Russia and Siberia between 1935 and 1945. Um, and this was because there were food shortages and they ate moldy grain that had overwintered in the field. And it wasn't until the early 50s that they made the link between the trichothecene mycotoxins produced by fusarium. In this case, it was fusarium sporotrichioides was the main culprit um, that caused these, uh, this problem. So if we go further back into history, there are examples of uh, epidemics or outbreaks of that are reminiscent of ATA. At that time, of course, they didn't, uh, they didn't know what the cause was and it was never described as alimentary toxic leukemia. So this goes as far back as the fifth century BC. So now that I've completed the history component of my talk, um, I am going to move on to my research interests. And I'm gonna start with a very, uh, brief overview of signaling mechanisms in plant pathogen interactions. And then I'll talk about a study in my lab on the MAP kinases in Fusarium. So when the fungus lands on the wheat spike and germinates, um, the plant can detect the fungus through what are called uh, pathogen associated molecular patterns. Also, uh, microbial associated molecular patterns. So this is, these are um, signature molecules that are associated with a pathogen or a, a microorganisms. For example, chitin is a, is a PAMP or a MAMP. Um, and these are recognized by cell surface receptors on the plant and they're called pattern recognition receptors. And once this is activated, you get a series of signaling responses. This includes, um, activation of the MAP kinase cascades, um, activation of pathogenesis-related proteins, hormone signalings, and then changes in, in gene expression. So changes in gene expression are often regulated by the acti activation of a MAP kinase pathway or hormone signaling. But the changes in gene expression can also lead to changes in hormone signaling. Um, as well as, of course, the defense-related response. Um, so many, many uh, researches historically in fusarium head blight wheat interaction have looked at transcriptomics and proteomic response, uh, but this is, this is really downstream compared to what happens at the early stages. And so this is where my interests lie now um, in the MAP kinases and the hormones. Um, and something else I was gonna say here. I don't remember what it is, so I will move on. So uh, what are MAP kinases? 
Uh, MAP kinases are regulatory proteins that have a very broad function in cell, cellular bio and biological activities. They're involved in cell division, uh, differentiation, they're involved in stress. And now I remember what I was going to say. So, so we, um, so, so this defense response that's mounted by the plant, the fungus also has mechanisms to suppress this defense response. So they secrete effector proteins. And incidentally, many of the, uh, the effector proteins are regulated by the Fusarium map kinases. Um, so they secrete effector proteins. And these effector proteins will interact with uh, things that lead to defense to a, a resistance in the host and block that mechanism, including interactions with MAP kinases, as well as transcription factors or other proteins. So, uh, so MAP kinases are regulatory proteins. Um, and they're also, as kinases, they are enzymes that phosphorylate other proteins, and they themselves are activated by phosphorylation. They function in a cascade. Um, so there are three subfamilies of the MAP kinase family. They're named the MAP kinase kinase kinase, also called the MAP triple kinase, uh, the MAP double kinases, and the MAP single kinases. So once you have a signal, extracellular signal or developmental cue, the uh, MAP triple kinase is activated by phosphorylation. Either of this can occur through uh, a receptor kinase that uh, phosphorylates the MAP triple kinase, or it can be autophosphorylation for the MAP triple kinase. And then the MAP triple kinase has specific MAP double kinase targets. And when those are phosphorylated in their activation loop, they will activate specific uh, interacting partners of MAP single kinases. And the MAP single kinase then phosphorylates a series of proteins. And so what happens when those proteins are phosphorylated, you can change their subcellular localization, can change their interaction with other proteins, or you can change their activity. So MAP kinases often are expressed constitutively in the cell, and their expression is typically very low, low level expression. What's important in a MAP kinase is whether it's activated. And so it needs to be turned on and on or off by reversal, reversible phosphorylation of key residues. So there are the, the residues in what we call the activation loop, where once those are phosphorylated, the enzyme is turned on. There are also, um, and, the, and they can be dephosphorylated by phosphatases, but there are also other uh, phosphorylation sites in the enzyme that can negatively regulate them, so prevent them from being activated. Um, and we can mimic phosphorylation by generating point mutations in these residues. And this is done, so here I have the example of the MAP kinases are activated by phosphorylation of serine, threonine, or tyrosine residues in their activation loop. So here is the uh, drawing of the serine, threonine, and tyrosine, and this is what they look like in a picture when they're phosphorylated. <laughs> Um, if you modify the activation loop residues to acidic residues, at least in the case of serine and threonine, you can mimic the chemistry of a phosphorylated serine or threonine. Um, and so if this is done in the activation loop, then uh, the enzyme can be uh, permanently activated. And you can also generate non-functional mutants by modifying them to, for example, the serine or threonine to an alanine or the tyrosine to a phenylalanine. In Fusarium graminarum, there are three MAP kinase pathways. Um, and we are interested uh, in this talk today in the cell wall integrity pathway. So in yeast, um, the uh, orthologs are uh, BCK1 is BCK1. MKK1 and 2, so there are partial redundant MAP double kinases here, and we just have the one in Fusarium graminarum, and then MPK1, the Fusarium graminarum ortholog is MGV1. So the cell wall integrity pathway is involved in cell wall biogenesis, cell division, polarized growth, as well as cell wall stress response. 
And I'm just going to give you a brief uh, background on how this pathway was identified in yeast. This was done using suppressor screens. So um, PKC1, this is the probable PKC is probably protein kinase C is the probably the best characterized protein kinase. It's the first one that we have structure information for. Um, and in, in yeast, they identified this PC, PCK, PKC1, and they knocked it out and determined that it was a lethal mutant. Um, and then they did a suppressor screen on the lethal mutant. So they took their, um, their mutant and exposed it to mutagens, and they selected for bypass of C kinase. So they selected for reversion to wild type phenotype. And they identified mutants um, that were they, what we call hyperactive mutants. So hyperactive mutants in BCK1 where the enzyme was always turned on. And so it didn't need PKC1 to turn it on. And we had reversion to wild type. And then this determined, this, this uh, indicated that PKC1 uh, activates BCK1. And then uh, when they mutated, knocked out BCK1, they found that it had a temperature sensitive growth defect. They also found, so they identified this map, uh, the MAP double kinases that had homologs to the human ERK MAP kinases. Um, so they were interested in this, these genes, and so they knocked them out. If you knock MKK1 out, or if you knock MKK2 one, there's no phenotype because it's partially redundant. But if you have the double mutant, if you have the same phenotype as the BCK1 knockout. And if you make a triple mutant with the BCK1 not knockout, there's no additive effect. So this indicated that they function together in a linear pathway. And to determine which one was upstream, they, uh, they uh, overexpressed uh, MKK1 in the BCK1 background and found that uh, it suppressed, sorry, in the BCK1 knockout background and found that it suppressed the, the knockout phenotype, so reversion to wild type. So BCK1 acts on MKK1 and 2, and then um, they knocked out MPK1 and found that it had the same phenotype as the BCK1 knockout. And again, they overexpressed MPK1 in the MKK1 and 2 knockout background and found that we had reversion to wild type, and so determined that MPK1 is downstream of MKK1 and 2. So this is the homologous pathway in Fusarium graminarum. And what we know about this pathway in Fusarium graminarum, so Wang et al, they published in 2011 the Fusarium graminarum genome, where they identified different kinases, and they determined that this is the homologous pathway to the yeast uh, cell wall integrity pathway. Um, and they they did show by yeast to hybrid interaction, which is notorious for false positives and false negatives. They did show that MKK1 interacts with MGB1. Um, then they um, made mutants of each of those genes. Um, and Hu et al. also looked at a knockout of MGB1 and found that it was uh, they were slow growth mutants. Um, they indicated that there was reduced virulence in wheat heads, but I would argue that if you have a slow growth mutant, it's hard to prove whether or not it's lost virulence because it's growing slowly or because it's a virulence factor. And keeping in mind a MAP kinase pathway regulates many different uh, uh, pathways underneath it. So it, it could include uh, virulence factors in its uh, repertoire. So they also found reduced dawn accumulation in wheat heads. Again, if you have slow growth, then you're likely to have reduced dawn accumulation. Um, and uh, Hu et al. also determined that it was incapable of undergoing sexual reproduction. Yun et al. knocked out the MKK1 and found that it, uh, the strain was had increased sensitivity to cell wall stress. So. Um, moving on to my uh, project, my original objective came about on this project because uh, I was just at a conference discussing with uh, some of my Ag Canada colleagues uh, some of our work, and and Chris Rampage and Gopal Subramaniam had this uh, MGV1 knockout gene, and they were interested in identifying downstream targets. And because of my interest in MAP kinases, 
I decided that I would join them and that I would generate, um, that I would help them find downstream targets of MGB1. And I would do this by generating constitutively active or hyperactive mutants of this pathway. Um, and then to see which proteins are phosphorylated in those strains. So uh, I hired a graduate student um, and she generated the knockout of MKK1. We had the MGV1 knockout uh, from, from our colleagues. And then we, she also generated the MKK1 and MGV1 overexpression strains, as well as the phosphomimic, which is the constitutively active or hyperactive form. So the enzyme in theory is always turned on if we did, if we made our changes uh, properly. So, um, so these are in locus overexpression. So we are able to introduce a promoter and the selection marker immediately upstream of the gene. And th in this case, we don't have any uh, ectopic expression occurring when we make our uh, overexpression strains. So this is what the wild type Fusarium graminarum looks like at six days and three days after growth on PDA. This is what the knockouts look like, slow growth uh, mutants. Um, the overexpression of MGB1 had no effect. The overexpression of MKK1 had reduced growth as well, but not like the knockouts. Um, interestingly, the phosphomimic <laughs> had slow growth as slow as the knockouts. So it's not necessarily unexpected to see slow growth phenotypes uh, when you mess with the expression level of a MAP kinase because the ratio of MAP kinases can have an impact on what happens. And because they regulate so many different things, it can throw the system out of whack. So this wasn't necessarily surprising, though I, I was surprised by this lethal type slow growth. Uh, but we do know that on other medium, such as carrot agar, it doesn't look like a lethal mutation. You do still get that slow growth and the phosphomimic is still as slow as the knockouts, but the MKK1 overexpression, and the MKK1 overexpression is a little bit faster than the knockout, but slower than the wild type. So of course we wanted to see what was happening downstream of MAP kinase activation. So the idea was that this phosphomimic should activate MGV1, which should then activate phosphorylated bunch of proteins underneath it, and we could identify what those were. So the first step was to see if MGV1 was being phosphorylated. Um, and we have the ability to, to do that using Westerns. Um, so um, we have access to uh, antibodies that recognize phosphorylated MAP kinases. You can buy these commercially. So just the MAP single kinases. So um, we don't have the knockout, um, but I but I'll tell you about that in a minute. So so this is these are the westerns. This is the um, total MGV one. So MGV one uh, plus that's unphosphorylated or phosphorylated will show up here. Unfortunately, we have a band that's very close to it, so it kind of obscures things. But you can see uh, not very well in this picture. But the this band underneath is the wild type. Um, in the wild type is the uh, MGV1, and here with the MGV1 overexpression, you can see it more intensely, um, and you don't see it in the knockout, but you do see it, again, I'm sorry for the quality of the picture, um, you do see it in the MKK1 overexpression. So it is present. Um, uh, when you overexpress MGV1, you see an increased uh, abundance of the MGV1, and also that's reflected in the phosphorylated MGV1. Um, and surprisingly in the knockout, I mean, in the overexpression strains, we didn't see any activation of MGV1. And I'll make a note here, this is a little bigger than the wild type. That's because we have a his tag on our, uh, on all of our strains, we put in a his tag on our um, overexpression strains. Um, so for the knockout, we don't have that uh, image yet, uh, or that data yet in our from our lab, but uh, UNIDL in their knockout study, they found they showed that it lost phosphorylation of MGV1 when you knocked it out, but gained phosphorylation in HOG1. And so if we look at HOG1, you can see in this case, HOG1, this is just the unphosphorylated protein, and you don't see very much. You do see in the overexpression phosphomimic, you see a little bit faint band there. Um, 
what you do see in the FOSS related hog one is that there is not very much, if you can even see that band in the wild type, but it shows up in the knockout of MGV1, in the overexpression of MGV1, in the MKK1 overexpression, and then you see a big increase in the phosphomimic. So that was very interesting. Uh, but the big question is this MGV1, uh, why we're not seeing phosphorylation of that. And so the question is, is MGV1 the actual target of MKK1 in Fusarium graminearum, assuming that I keep going back in my mind, maybe this isn't an act actually an activated form of the enzyme, but we see the same phenotype in the, in the overexpression strain, which should be able to become activated. Um, maybe there's a condition, another condition where uh, MGB1 will be activated. Here, we just looked at growth in, in PDB. We don't have any treatment. Um, and you might ask, does MKK1 phosphorylate hog one? But the thing is, um, so MGV1 and GPM, GMPK1 are ERK-like MAP kinases, whereas HOG1 is a P38-like MAP kinases. And if you go to look at mammalian system, the P38 MAP single kinases are phosphorylated by a group of MAP double kinases that are different from those MAP double kinases that phosphorylate ERK-like MAP kinases. So I think that to be an unlikely scenario. Um, so in any case, our new objective was now to characterize the CWI pathway in Fusarium graminearum um, because, I mean, for one, we can't identify the downstream targets, but we also have a, an interesting phenotype, and we wanted to pursue that further. So we're looking at various things, including stress response, cell wall maintenance, sexual reproduction, vegetative growth, mycotoxin production, and these are all at different stages. But I'm going to present to you the chemotropism data because I find that to be the most interesting. So chemotropism is the ability of fungi to direct growth towards a stimulus, such as a mating, uh, I'm sorry, which is important for mating or feeding. And in uh, filamentous, sorry, in yeast, it's regulated by the filamentous growth and mating response pathway. So that uh, MAP kinase pathway, the third one that, where GMPK is the, the MPK at the bottom of the pathway. So in uh, higher fungi, it was also determined that it's also regulated by the CWI pathway through this ST2 receptor. So this work was originally done in Fusarium oxysporum in Professor DiPietro's lab. Um, and my colleague, Michelle Lowen uh, at NRC and University of Ottawa, she was looking at uh, ST2 and chemotropism in Fusarium graminearum, and she determined that uh, this pathway is involved in Fusarium graminearum as well. And so uh, just a couple of notes. So HRP, horseradish peroxidate, and wheat exudate can both induce chemotropism in Fusarium graminearum. And this is the, uh, in this chart here, we have chemotropism index, which is a measure of chemotropic growth. And here we've got Roblin exudate and HRP. And in the wild type, you see chemotropic growth in response to each of these stimuli. When you knock out STE2, you get loss of chemotropism. When you add it back to the mutant, you regain chemotropic growth. So we know HRP and wheat exudate induce chemotropism. ST2 is required for chemotropism. And she also worked with our um, MGV1 overexpression strain and the same knockout that we were working with as well, and found that similarly to ST2, MGV1 is also required for chemotropism. So when we looked, oh, um, and she also showed that HRP induces phosphorylation in the wild type of MGV1. So this is the control, this is the HRP treatment in wild type Fusarium graminearum. And you see, this is a Western again, you see MGV1 is activated or phosphorylated. And then I asked her um, to look at our MKK1 strains. And this is what we found. For the MKK knockout, we only have the HRP treatments at this time, but we found that there was no impact on chemotropism. This was very surprising because it's supposed to be part of this pathway, right? Um, 
So MKK1 is perhaps not needed for chemotropism. When we overexpress it, we still see no effect. That's not necessarily surprising considering the previous result or, or regardless of the previous result. What is surprising is that when you express the activated form, you lose chemotropism. So does this mean that MKK1 activation blocks chemotropism? Is MKK1 a negative regulator of chemotropism? Um, so this is one of the things that I love about science, love and hate about science is, you know, you, you have a hypothesis, you design an experiment, you might answer some questions, <laughs> but you also often have new questions. And sometimes that can be very frustrating, <laughs> but I also think it's very exciting. So um, here, just a summary of the key results for the CWI pathway in Fusarium graminarum from our work. So MKK1 overexpression, either as the wild type or the phosphor mimic, does not activate MGV1 under normal conditions. We haven't assessed any others yet. We know that chemotropism is induced by horseradish peroxidase, and so is the activation of MGV1. And we know that ST2 and MGV1 are both required for chemotropism. And maybe MKK1 negatively regulates chemotropism. So this lets, uh, leads to the question of whether uh, MKK1 is part of this pathway. Does BCK1 phosphorylate MKK1? Does ST2 phosphorylate MK, uh, BCK1? Um, and I, I think it's way too early to come to any actual conclusions about this. Um, perhaps we're more at a hypothesis stage. Um, there's still a lot of work to be done to explain this. It may be that this, um, that our data is a result of some unexplained <laughs> thing that's happening, but that MKK1 does in fact function in this pathway. Um, so there's a lot of work that still needs to be done and, um, I'm looking forward to, to finding more answers and maybe more questions. So um, at this time, I would like to thank you for your attention and for, again, for the opportunity to present to this group. Um, uh, a lot of the work that I, from my lab that was presented, most of it was uh, my former graduate student, Deanna Viss, um, and with help from other colleagues in the lab. Uh, all of the chemotropism work was carried out by students in Michelle Lowen's lab. And, um, and then, of course, my colleagues, uh, Gopal and Chris, uh, I always enjoy uh, working with them and getting feedback from them. Uh, they're a good group of uh, people that I work with. And um, Nihal uh, also contributed as uh, Deanna uh, co-supervisor from the University of Lethbridge and had a lot of input in in a lot of his experiment, her experiments, and I appreciate everyone's help and contribution. The work was funded by uh, Genomic Research and Development Initiative, as well as AVASE, which is internal uh, AAFC funding. So thank you. Wonderful, thank you 